Anyway, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This morning, we're going to spend our time looking at the first eight verses of this chapter in a message that I've titled, Turn the Other Cheek. Turn the Other Cheek. But first, let's, let's bow and, and seek the Lord for just a moment in prayer. Father, we, we thank you this morning that we have the opportunity to hear from you. Lord, we thank you that, 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 that what we're reading this morning is your written word. But Lord, this word that we're reading this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is just as relevant to the times that we are living in today as it was for, for the times that they, the Corinthians, were living in back in that day. So we pray that, that as you spoke to them and, 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 and ministered to them, you would speak to us in this place this morning. So we pray that you'd give us ears to hear your word, but then hearts that are brave enough to actually uh, take it in and receive it and do something with it. Help us to take your word, to hear it, and become doers of your word this morning. This is our prayer. This is our heart's desire, and we pray it now in Jesus' name, and everyone say it. Amen. Amen. So now, as I mentioned, the, the title of this message is Turn the Other Cheek. Uh, you know, because uh, after all, we, we know that, that Jesus told us that when, when someone has hurt us, when someone has wronged us, that we're supposed to turn the other cheek, right? But let's face it, uh, frankly, that is easier said than it is done. Am I right? In fact, one of my favorite stories, and I've shared it a bunch of times before, but it's the story of a, a, of a boxer in Ireland who retired from boxing and became a pastor of a church. And so one evening he's walking home and all of a sudden this drunk guy uh, confronts him, starts mouthing off to him, and, and, and then sure enough, hauls off and punches him in the face. Well, at that, the, the, the pastor just kind of shook it off and turned the other cheek. Well, at that, the, sure enough, this drunk guy hauls off and punches him in that side of the face too. Well, now at that point, this Irish boxer turned pastor rolls up his sleeves and he says, the good Lord left me no further instructions. Pow! You know, he just, you know, because it's easier said than done, Right? Well, now listen, we, we live in a day where, 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 where we cry out for justice, a day that demands justice. You know, when, when someone's been victimized, when someone's been oppressed, when someone's been taken advantage of, what do we do in this culture? We cancel them, right? You know, we, we make sure that they are forever branded by their injustice, that they never live it down so that others won't get hurt. Well, in, in many ways, that describes the Corinthians here in the passage that we're reading about this morning. We're going to see that, that, they were, that they were quick to seek justice, but they were slow to forgive. And, and by the way, the issue in chapter 6 is not how to handle it when a non-Christian attacks you, but rather uh, the, the issue is, is what to do when, when, when the injustice that was done to you was committed by a fellow Christian, when it was committed by a fellow follower of Jesus Christ. So now with that, now let's look at these eight verses. And in these eight verses, we're going to see what to do or what happens, rather, when the church is taking their cues from the world. And so in verse 1, it says, When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to, to, go to law before the, the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Now, by the way, that word saint is used as a synonym for Christian, a follower of Christ. So he says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that, 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 that you are to judge the angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you who is wise enough to settle a dispute between, be, between the brothers, but brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers? To have lawsuits with, at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers." So now, as I implied, uh, the, the thing with the church in Corinth, the problem with that church was that, that the church of Corinth was taking their cues from the world rather than from the word, rather than from the word. And so as a result, we've seen over the last several weeks now in this study that, that this was a church that was filled with division, you know, believer, divided against believer. But this was also a church, like we saw last week in chapter 5, that was riddled with sexual scandal. Hey, we saw that in chapter 5, and now this morning in chapter 6, we now see that they were also dragging each other into the courtroom over the slightest injustice. 
In fact, really, that ancient Greek culture was a culture that had, a, had an overinflated view of justice. And, and so as a result, when, when, when someone hurt you, when someone wronged you, you would drag them into court to make sure you get the justice that you deserve. In fact, in the ancient Greek world, uh, that, that culture, basically everyone was suing everyone. Uh, for, over the slightest perceived injustice. In fact, I looked this up in the original Greek language. In the original Greek, it's pronounced Frank Azar. Uh, okay, that part's not true, but, but what is true is, is, that, is that there's an ancient Greek saying that said that every Greek was a lawyer. And so basically, every Greek was Frank Azar. In fact, there was a, a Greek playwright by the name of Aristophanes, and Aristophanes wrote this play, and, and, he, and he wrote into it a character who was looking at, at a world map and he looks up and he says, where's Greece? And then someone points out and shows him where Greece is on the map. And he says, well, that can't be right. Uh, there's got to be some kind of mistake because I don't see any kind of lawsuits going on. They were world famous for suing each other, world famous for seeking justice. And so in that ancient culture, here's what would happen. If someone wronged you, you would go and get an objective third party that was called an arbitrator. And the arbitrator would try to resolve the differences between you. But if that failed, and it usually did, well, then you would take them to court. And then the court would assign each of you a public attorney. Now, in the end, if, 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 if you felt like you still did not get the justice that you deserved, well, then you could appeal your case and basically bring it to their version of the Supreme Court, where your case could be heard be, be, before a jury, a, a jury of hundreds and sometimes even, even thousands you have to understand this, this version of, of, of their Supreme Court, as I call it, uh, for, for the Greek citizens, that was entertainment. I mean, people would travel from miles and miles just to watch this. People would travel from all over just to be a jury member. It's not like in our day, we get the jury summons and we're like, oh, I got to call in sick. I mean, everyone wanted to be a part of this. I mean, you know, it, was, it was entertaining. I mean, basically being in, in the jury was like being a, a, a member of the live studio audience of America's Got Talent. And so, you know, it was, it, was, it was entertainment for them. That was the Greek culture. But now, the problem here in this chapter is, is, that, is that the Corinthians, uh, the Christians living in the city of Corinth, they were, as I said, were taking their cues from the world. You see, it's not that, that they were being attacked by those who, who were offended by their Christian values or, or, or being attacked by those who had some kind of a political agenda. You know, we see that nowadays. We see a lot of that. You know, some of you may remember a couple of years ago the case of Jack Phillips. Now, Jack Phillips is a, is a, a cake decorator in Lakewood, Colorado, who, 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 was, who, who was sued multiple times because he refused to bake a wedding cake for a same-sex marriage. And now, in the end, the couple that was suing him uh, admitted that, 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 that they were targeting him, that they knew that he was a Christian, and, and they knew that what his values were, and so because of that, they knew what kind of stand that he would take, and that's why they targeted him, to make him an example. But that's not what was happening in chapter 6. You see, the problem here in chapter 6 is, is not that the church was being attacked by the world. Rather, the problem was that the church was attacking itself. Uh, that, that Christian was suing fellow Christian. And in the process, while they were dragging each other into the courtroom, they were also dragging the name of Jesus into the mud. And, and, and when you think about it, that ancient culture, not too different from our modern culture. In fact, really, the, the only difference between our modern culture today and that culture that Paul was addressing is, is that nowadays, you know, when we fight for, 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 for some injustice, when, when we fight for justice, listen, we take our fight into the court of public opinion. I mean, yeah, we'll still sue one another, but really, we, we fight in the court of public opinion. You know, think about it. We, we live in, 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 the, in, in the day, and I mentioned it earlier, we live in the day of cancel culture. Now, cancel culture has been defined as a tool that, that gives the less powerful a voice against those who oppress them and, and, and marginalize them so that when the justice system fails, you can cancel them. So again, it's been defined as a, as a tool that brings gropers to justice and exposes bullies for what they really are. And listen, that's just the culture that we live in. I'm not mad at it, and yet I'm not saying that I'm a fan of it. I'm just acknowledging that that happens to be the, the culture that we're living in today. But here's the problem. The problem is that just like the Corinthians of Paul's day, the problem is, is that the church in, in our day, Christians in our day, we, we might not be dragging each other into the courtroom, but we are dragging each other into the court of public opinion. 
You know, we, we may not be suing each other, but we have no problem canceling our fellow brother in Christ, our sister in Christ, who offended us. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe they don't share the same end times view that we share. Maybe they don't share the same political views that we share. So what do we do? We blast them on social media. You know, I read an article about a year ago titled, Why Are Christians So Unchristian When It Comes to Politics? Now, in the article, they, they mentioned that LifeWay Research found that 8 out of 10 Christians say that, that their faith influences how they vote. Now, listen, that's a good thing. Your faith should influence how you vote. But the article goes on to say that, that, that many Christians do not treat their political enemies very Christ-like. In fact, 50% of Christians say that it is okay to personally insult and personally attack your political enemy, even if your political enemy is a fellow Christian, a fellow believer in Jesus. In fact, to illustrate that, and I've shared this before, but, but Brian Broderson, who is, who is the pastor of Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa, uh, back when, when Biden was first elected as president, uh, uh, Brian Broderson on his Insta- Instagram account just got up and posted and said, pray for the new president, pray for our new leader. And then he quoted 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, by the way, tells us to pray for our leaders no matter who our leaders are. Now keep in mind, when the Apostle Paul wrote those words in 1 Timothy chapter 2, the leader at that time was Nero, who was beheading Christians at the time. And, and so the idea is, is that we pray for our leaders, no matter if, if we like them or not, no matter if we believe what they believe or not. It doesn't matter if it's Biden or Trump or if it's Bush or, or Obama. That, that No matter who it is, we pray for our leaders because the Bible tells us to pray for our leaders. So Brian Broderson, he, he posts that, and, and then sure enough, uh, he, he gets a barrage of attack, a barrage of insults, a barrage of accusations from fellow Christians calling him a false pastor, calling him a baby killer, and calling him an agent of the devil himself. This is what I mean when I say that, that we drag each other into the court of public opinion. And so it would seem that today, just like the ancient church of Corinth, it seems today... The church today is taking its cues from the world rather than from the word. Now with that, now let's break these verses down. So let's go back and as we look at the first three verses, verses one through three, we see that Paul tells you that you will judge the world one day. And so in verse one, Paul says again, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare to go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that, that you are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? Now it's interesting. Paul says here that, that you one day will judge the world. In fact, Jesus in Revelation chapter 2 verse 26 said, To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. Likewise, Jesus said in Revelation 3.21, he said, To him who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So let me see if I can explain this. You see, as far as I understand it, the, the next event on the, on the quote-unquote prophetic calendar would be the rapture of the church, the removal of the church from planet Earth. The, the, at some point, Jesus is going to come back for his church, remove the church, and take us to heaven. And that's something that can happen at any minute, maybe even before I finish this sermon. But it can happen at any moment. Now, shortly after the rapture of the church, the removal of the church, Then a new world leader will emerge on the scene, a one world leader. The Bible nicknames him the Antichrist. But when this leader comes on the scene, he's going to sign a seven-year peace treaty with the nation of Israel. Now, by the way, during that same seven-year period of time, the Bible in in the book of Revelation calls that seven-year period of time, it calls it the seven-year tribulation period. Because it's during those seven years that God will pour his wrath on, on the earth pour out his judgment on the earth. Now, by the way, keep in mind, as I said, during those seven years, at the beginning of it, there are no Christians on the planet. All Christians have been removed from the earth. We've all been raptured. There's no Christians on planet earth at this point. So therefore, during those seven years, anyone during that time who chooses to believe in Jesus and and follow Jesus, they are now what is called a tribulation believer, a tribulation saint, the Bible would call them. Now, at the end of those seven years, the, uh, Revelation chapter 20 says that that's when Jesus returns physically to planet Earth. And, and by the way, Revelation 20 says that we return with him. 
Why? Because for the last seven years, we've been in heaven with Jesus. And so now when Jesus leaves heaven, we come with him and and we come back to the earth where Jesus sets up his kingdom on the earth and he'll rule and reign for a thousand years. But the scripture says that we will rule and reign with him. Now, I'm not really sure what that's going to look like. I I, I don't really know exactly how that's all going to happen. But but evidently, uh, what it means is is that any time one of these quote-unquote tribulation believers... One of these people who chose to believe in Jesus during those seven years after the rapture, well, anytime that they have a dispute with each other, an argument with each other, evidently we're going to be the judge. We're going to be the arbitrators who are going to help them settle their disputes with one another. And so it's like sarcastically as if Paul's saying, hey, listen, how is it that, that those of you that are going to be judges one day, that those of you who, who are going to be settling disputes in the millennial kingdom can't even resolve your issues with each other right here, right now? Now, on that note, remember Jesus said this in John chapter 14, verse 16. Jesus said, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, and he may abide with you forever. Now, the helper he's talking about is the Holy Spirit. Now, what's interesting is that word helper, it's the Greek term paraclete. Now, a a paraclete means one who is called alongside to help. Now, what's interesting is is that in that culture, at that time, the word paraclete was used in a couple of different ways, and and one way it was used is in the legal sense. And when it was used in the legal sense, it would be translated advocate or lawyer. And so, you know, what it's saying is is that that when, when you're being sued, when you're being hauled into the courtroom, well, the paraclete comes alongside you and defends you. He is your defense attorney. So now, in in this context, think of it this way. Let's say that you and another Christian are at odds with each other. And so, you know, if if you're a Christian and they're a Christian, listen, what that means is, is that they have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. They have the defense attorney dwelling inside of them. But at the same time, you also have the same Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. You have the same defense attorney dwelling inside of you. So shouldn't you be able to resolve your differences with each other? I mean, after all, you have the same lawyer. The same helper, the same advocate dwells in you that dwells in them. And so Paul's saying, listen, you're filled with the Spirit of God. You're filled with God's Spirit. And you're going to be judges of the world. You're going to be helping people resolve their differences. So certainly you should be able to figure it out right here, right now. And now with that, verses 4 through 6, Paul kind of, you know, gets his Game of Thrones on. And he's like, shame, shame, shame. (laughs) You know, verse verse 4. Paul says, so if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there's no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between, between brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now, notice that last line. He says, and that before unbelievers. Notice that it's plural and not singular. You're not bringing your your case before an unbeliever. You're bringing your case before unbelievers. In other words, it's not just just that you have the audacity to bring your your, your issue before a pagan judge, but you're bringing the whole issue before a pagan jury. A jury of hundreds, maybe even thousands. And again, that jury was more like the live audience of America's Got Talent. They were there for entertainment purposes only. And and so he's saying, you know what what you're doing is is you're turning your brother in Christ, you're turning your sister in Christ into a public spectacle for the whole world to laugh at and mock. You're making a mockery of your brother in Christ. Now on that note, we should remember that Jesus said in John 13, 35, he says, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Not if you sue one another, not if you cancel one another, if you have love for one another. Now here's what's ironic. What's ironic is is Paul's writing the same group of people who back in chapter 5, this was the same group who were bragging about how loving they were about how, how tolerant, how accepting they were, that they were bragging that, that they could accept this guy who, who, who was in this incestuous relationship with his stepmother, they could accept him into their church. And so they were bragging about how loving they were, and yet at the same time they had no problem dragging their brother in Christ into the courtroom for the world to mock. And so Paul, that's why he says in verse 5, I say this to your shame. I like the way one paraphrase of the Bible puts this. It's called the message. Now, by the way, not the biggest fan of the message. It's kind of sketchy. But in this particular case, I like the rendering. 
it says in the message version, it says, I say this as bluntly as I can to wake you up to the stupidity of what you're doing. I think that made the point. (laughs) It reminds me of something that the pastor Tony Evans recently said. Now, some of you uh, listen to Tony Evans on the radio, or you've seen him on TV, read some of his books. But Tony Evans lately has been talking about how Christians are, are, are participating in this, in this cancel culture, and we don't even know it. Because we get on social media, and, and we just blast one another on social media. We, we cancel somebody that we don't agree with. We just, you know, or, or we boycott Home Depot, or we do this, or we do that, but we're, we're part of this cancel culture, and we don't even know it. And so Tony Evans writes and says, it's embarrassing, I mean, downright embarrassing to read, this, to read social media and see the vitriol, the hatred, the evil, the downright hellishness of Christians going at each other. We have become more pagan than the non-Christian world. That's the essence of what Paul is saying when he says, I say this to your shame. Or again, the message translation, I say this as bluntly as I can to wake you up to the stupidity of what you're doing. And now in verses 7 and 8, now Paul tells them what they should have done. They should have been turning the other cheek. And so in verse 7, Paul says, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Now, by the way, let me just make, the Apostle Paul was not saying that Christians should never go to trial. The Apostle Paul was not saying that, that you should never stand before a secular judge. That's not what he's saying. Keep in mind, Romans chapter 13 tells us to submit to governing authorities. In other words, we're, we're, we're to obey the law of the land. Romans 13, 5, it says, Therefore, it's necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. Or as the New Century Version renders it, it says, So you must yield to the government, not only because you might be punished, but because you know what is right. So think of it this way. Let's say that you're speeding and you get caught speeding. And they want custody. Well, now the law of the land is going to require you to to appear in divorce court. So what we're saying is is that being a Christian does not give you a a get-out-of-jail-free card. Or in this case, a get-out-of-the-courtroom-free card. You know, like the guy who, who, who just became a Christian, but he was standing on trial for a crime that he committed before he became a Christian. And so he turns and he says, you know, you know Your Honor, uh, the, the crime that I'm guilty of committing is, is something that I committed before I was a Christian. But now I've gotten saved. You know, Jesus has changed my life. The Bible says I'm a new creation. The Bible says I'm a new man. He says that, that thing I did, that's something that the old man did. Well, the judge responded and said, well, you know, I, I think I understand what you're saying. He says, after all, I too am a Christian. But as a Christian, as a fellow believer in Christ, I believe that Christians are supposed to be good witnesses in this world. So therefore, I'm going to sentence the old man to five years in prison. And I'm going to sentence the new man to another five years in prison. (laughs) There's no get out of jail free card. In fact, if anything, as Christians, we're we're more accountable because not only do we know the laws of the land, we know the word of God. By the way, I want to point out that, that as we read this passage, do, do not picture the Apostle Paul as, as the grumpy, get-off-my-lawn guy. You know, this guy who's got his socks hiked up to his knees and just shouting at the clouds in the sky. He's not just, just, just this angry old guy, just, you know, just you know, uh, confronting pagan culture. He wasn't like confronting the, this culture that had this, this over-inflated view of, of justice, this culture that, that was bent on making sure that, that, if, that if you got hurt, that you make the people who hurt you pay so that not only do they not hurt you, they don't do it to anyone else. Paul was not confronting that culture. What Paul was confronting was the church for conforming to the culture the church for conforming to the culture. You see, Paul, Paul didn't have a problem with, with pagans who were behaving like pagans because that's what pagans do. Pagans are pagans. They live like pagans. So Paul had no problem with that. Paul's problem was that the church was behaving like pagans. As I said, the church was taking their cues from the world and not from the word. Listen, the word. That is, the word of God is counterculture. Romans 12, too, it says... Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so what was the Apostle Paul's countercultural advice for the church in Corinth? Well, he tells him in verse 7, he says, Why not rather suffer wrong? 
Why not rather be defrauded? Or as the New Living Translation renders it, it says, why not just accept the injustice and leave it at that? Why not let yourselves be cheated? Now listen, in this culture that we live in here today, somebody hears those words and, 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 and they have a problem. Because right away, you're, you're like, why not just accept the injustice and leave it at that? What are you talking about? We can't accept the injustice. They've got to pay for what they've done. We, we've, we've got to make an example of them so, so that others don't follow that, what they did and, and hurt more people. We've got, to, we've got to draw the line. But Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 and 39, he said, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist him who is evil, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him also the other. Now, we should point out that Jesus was actually quoting Exodus chapter 21. Now, here's the context of Exodus chapter 21. What was happening in Exodus chapter 21 is, let, let, let's say you got in a fight with somebody, and in the context of that fight, they knock out one of your teeth. Well, what Exodus is, is saying is, 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 is that, you know, the, you have the right to respond, but, you know, maybe, maybe they, they don't just knock out one of your teeth. Maybe there's an innocent bystander. Maybe, maybe your wife, maybe she loses an eye. Or maybe it's your child, and they lose a hand. Well, now, when that happens, you know, when, when, when someone you love, an innocent bystander, when they've been hurt, what happens? Well, now, you're enraged. You're outraged. I mean, you, your blood is boiling, and, and you're going to snap. And so it's in that context that Exodus 21, verses 23 and 24 says, but if, but if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, or foot for foot. It's tempting to, to read that verse and think, well, this is a verse that's, that's promoting revenge. But actually, it's not promoting revenge. It's actually putting a limit on revenge. What it's saying is, is that, you know what? If you got in this fight and they knocked out one of your teeth, well, then you're allowed to take one of their teeth in return, not all of their teeth. It's saying, you know, if, if they took your hand, you, you, know, you can take a hand, but you can't like take, you know, chop off both of their hands and both of their feet to make sure it never happens again. It's putting a limit on it. Because you see, God knows our heart. And God knows that deep down, not only do we want justice, not only do we want to make them pay what they owe, but deep down, we not only want them to pay what they owe, but we want them to pay with interest. We make, make sure that it never happens again. And so Jesus, he quotes it and says, you know, it's been said, eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But then Jesus takes it a step further and he says, but I say to you, turn the other cheek. Now, in this culture that we live in, this cancel culture that we live in, you know, people might hear that and, and that might offend them. You know, how can you turn the other cheek? Listen, by, by turning the other cheek, you're, you're allowing them to do it. You're allowing them to get away with it. You, you're allowing them to keep doing the, the injustice that they did. You're, you're enabling them to, 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 to oppress people. You're enabling them to victimize people. You know, if, if, if you keep turning their cheek, they're just going to keep doing it. You've got to draw the line. You've got to put a stop to this. You see, to some in the culture that we live, they think the message of Christianity is weak. That the message of Christianity is saying, you know what? Uh, that you, you turn a blind eye to injustice and just let it keep happening. Turn the other cheek. That's not the message of Christianity. See, the message of Christianity is, is, is actually saying, you know what? By turning the other cheek, what I'm doing is I'm leaving them in the hand of God. Because I actually believe in God. See, that's the difference. Because I believe in God, I believe God's going to deal with it. Because they don't believe in God, they believe they have to deal with it. But I believe in God. I believe that, that, that Romans chapter 12, verse 19 means what it says when it says, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. And so because I actually believe in God, I trust that he's going to deal with it. The, 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 yeah, that, that was unjust. That was unfair. But it's not going to go undealt with. God will deal with every injustice. And by the way, let me just say to this culture, I agree with you. I agree that, that, that this world is filled with evil. This world is filled with injustice. In fact, frankly, that's the reason Jesus died on the cross. You see, Jesus didn't die on the cross to, to sweep human injustice under the rug. No, Jesus died on the cross because the injustice of this world was so great, someone had to pay. So he paid. 
Every injustice, every injustice that you've done, every injustice that I've done, every injustice that's been done to you, every injustice in this world is so great, no one in this world is able to pay for it. And that's why he paid for it. That's why the Bible says it's paid in full. You see, what we have is, is, is a battle between two opposing worldviews. Two worldviews that are in conflict with each other. Two opposite worldviews. Uh, on the one hand, you, you have, you have uh, the, the culture's view of the world. Now, this might be defined as, as critical theory in the classroom. But, but the, 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 the culture's view of the world is, is that, you know what? In this world, all people are divided into two different categories. Either the oppressed or the oppressor. And the oppressor needs to be taken down. The oppressor needs to be, 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 be taken care of. And so those oppressive institutions, those oppressive establishments, the oppressive structure needs to be destroyed and rebuilt. That's, that's the culture's worldview. But then there's an opposing worldview, and that's the Christian worldview. And the Christian worldview looks at the world and says, no, there's not just two types of people. It's not the oppressed and the oppressor. The uh, Christian worldview is, you know what? All people were made in the image of God. And that's why you matter. That's why you have value. You are valuable because you were made in the image of God. All people matter. All people have value. But the problem is that we sinned against God, and that's why we need to be saved from our sins by the work of Jesus on the cross. And so one view, uh, a critical theory view, would say that the fundamental problem of, of the world today is, is rooted in, in the abuse of power. And so those abuse of power institutions and, and systems need to be taken down. But the other view, the Christian worldview, would say, no, the, the fundamental problem in the world today is rooted in sin. And because of sin, we're separated from God. And that's why there's evil in this world. That's why there's injustice in, the world, in this world. We agree with you. There is injustice in, the, in this world, but it's rooted in sin, our sin. And so the answer is, is that we need to be reconciled to God. We need to actually be transformed and changed by God. And so Paul's exhortation to, to, to the church is this. His exhortation is that, you know what? When, when the church actually gets their cue from the word, and not from the world. That is, you know, when, when those of us who have really been changed and transformed by the love of God start to actually truly love our neighbor as ourselves, just like Jesus told us to, when we actually love our enemies like Jesus told us to, when we actually have fellowship across all lines, uh, whether, whether it's racial lines or, or class lines or gender lines, but when we truly have relationship, when we're truly loving one another, what we are doing is we are showing this world that what they're truly looking for can actually be found in Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus said in John 13, 35, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. In this world that's canceling each other, we as Christians need to be loving one another. Why? Because this world doesn't need justice. This world needs Jesus. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for your word. It's hard to hear, but we need to hear it. Because in this cancel culture, the world doesn't need more canceling. No, the, the injustice of the world, the sin of the world has been canceled at the cross. You paid it all. And so, Lord, help us to, to model that there is an answer to what the world's looking for. But the answer isn't in taking down this institution and in bringing that down that oppressor. The answer is looking to the cross, looking to the one who paid it all, and not only be the one who accepts you and believes in you, but to be changed by you, transformed by you. And as your love changes us, then we love one another. And as we love one another the world sees that you are the answer. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Why don't we stand and sing one more time to the Lord?